Well, thank you very much. It's really a privilege and an honor to come to North Farm and talk about this project. I've uh, made several dozen presentations all over the East Bay, uh, several in Bristol, but it's really good to talk to people who haven't heard this story before. So, let me uh, start from the beginning. Um, as I explained to Pat, I, I live on Burr's Hill. How many people have been to the Warrentown Beach? Okay, yeah, it's a great little spot. And across the street from it is Burr's Hill Park. Okay, and if you go back in the upper right hand corner there, that's where my house is. So when the leaves are off the trees, I can see the park every morning when I get up. Notice uh, what was constructed there two years ago, uh, two months before I retired. Um, there was a uh, interment of over 600 Native American uh, artifacts that were removed from Burr's Hill in 1913 by Charles Carr. Charles was a uh, the town librarian at the George Hale Library, where my wife was a librarian for 10 years in the 90s. And uh, Charles, back in 1913, decided that rather than let everybody continue to loot a Native American gravesite, he would make the effort and come in and he removed uh, the grave items from 42 Native American graves there. Um, two years ago, May of 2017, the Mashpee tribe, who had obtained permission from the town, uh, came and reinterred those in a vault buried underground, now marked by a monument to Massasoit, or the Massasoit, because that means chief of Osamequan, uh, who we'll learn a little bit more about in a few minutes. That got me very interested in what was going on because it was in, literally in my backyard. Uh, how could I not be interested? And um, I met the, uh, the woman in the lower left photo, Helen Jader, uh, who had a, a very great interest in preserving uh, the history of this area. Uh, and she came up with the idea of creating a Soames heritage area. Now, Soames, if you're not from Barrington, you might not recognize the, the name, but that means southern area. It was the native area where Osamequan, or the Massasoit, who met the pilgrims in 1620, where he lived. Okay? So he lived, I, I think, probably more, spent more time over in Tyler Point in Barrington, but. Uh, if you go by the uh, Warren Town Hall, you will see a frieze up above the door that says Somme 1621. Hmm. And it has a Western Indian <laughs> on there, but uh, back in 1898, that was what they conceived of as the home of the Massasoit. And so Warren was n essentially named as the home of the Massasoit at that time. Um, and Helen said, uh, we ought to do something to honor him and to help preserve this area uh, that has been radically changed in the last 400 years. So I had done a, uh, a little digging about 15 years prior um, around the King Philip War. Anybody heard of the King Philip mm -hmm. War? Yeah. Okay, because I'm not going to mm -hmm. tell you a whole lot about it. Uh, it's long and complicated, but in any case, uh, uh, there was a well site, the Hugh Cole Well. He was the first settler in Warren, uh, behind the Kickamuit Middle School. And the plaque, the bronze plaque that had been put there in the 1920s had been removed. Uh, so I worked with uh, some family members and we got a new plaque, not made out of bronze, it looks like that, and replaced that on the stone that you see me standing next to there, um, and had a little ceremony. Uh, that was about uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, so that was my first taste of early history. But it wasn't until I met with Helen and heard her presentation that I really began to understand that there was a lot more to local history than just the King Philip War. I'm going to play you a little video that Helen did. And if things work out right here, <laughs> you'll get to hear it. And this is just 30 seconds of a four-minute video that's on the website. You can hear the whole thing. 
It can be argued that Soames is the pivotal place of cultural exchange between indigenous people and colonizing settlers in North America. Few people realize that there was a peace treaty between the Poconoke tribe and the Puritans established around March 21st, 1621, which lasted over 50 years. One idea to consider is the establishment of a Soames National Heritage District, which could provide a framework for an appreciation of Soames and the role of the Poconoket in the heritage of our country. A Soames district could provide an encompassing approach featuring the essential cultural, natural, scenic, historic, and recreational open spaces of Soames in a way that celebrates this layered history for residents and draws new visitors. If we begin now, we could ensure that the Soames Heritage District is well established before the 400th anniversary of the peace treaty in 2021. Okay. I don't need to say anything more. She summed it all up in 30 seconds there, okay? What she was after was basically creating a new district um, that reflected the, uh, uh, the region that was occupied by of Native Americans. Now, if you're European in descent, you think, well, the only people who were here were us, right? We came here. There wasn't anybody else living here. Well, you would be very mistaken. There were literally five million people living across North America at, in 1620, and about 100,000 people in New England at the time very well established and those folks had been here uh, for about 12,000 years, okay, so long before the pyramids or long before the Acropolis in Athens, etc. There, there was a whole civilization uh, complete with their language and traditions uh, who had occupied this area for that time. So in 1620 uh, there was an encounter between these two populations. These three maps give you some orientation to this. The, the top left map is one by Thomas Bicknell in 1908. Uh, he was the uh, Barrington resident who was head of the Department of Education for Rhode Island who wrote a very extensive book on Soames and argued that uh, the native uh, land here uh, which was transferred uh, to the English settlers over a period of time really has a, a rich history including some of the names of uh, some you're familiar with, like the names of the Indians, of the, the uh, Metacomet and uh, uh, Massasoit and those names, but also uh, Kasumpsit, okay, which is the, the peninsula that you're on right now, okay. Those names have been s substantially erased from our experience, okay. But that's what this land was known as. Um, that area, the southern area, is just a portion of the land occupied by the Poconoket. Now, you have heard the name Wampanoag over and over again. Well, the name Wampanoag didn't come into usage till after 1700, after the King Philip War. If you look at any map prior to 1700, it will say Poconoket on it. Okay, uh, But the name Poconoket was erased after the King Philip War as a way to expunge the culture from the area. And the name Wampanoag, which is really a name of the nation of all Indian tribes in Massachusetts and southern Rhode Island, uh, became common usage. So you'll see maps today that show Wampanoag, Massachusetts, Nipmuc, Narragansett, and then Pequot uh, Mohegan. Okay, you're probably most familiar with the Pequots with the uh, with a casino, okay, but those are the, the five major tribes that uh, occupied this area. Uh, but if you erase the name Wampanoag and put the original name Poconoket, you will be more accurate in terms of your understanding of who those people were who occupied this land. So 12,000 years, people living along the shores here, right down your street here, okay, there were hundreds of people living successfully for thousands of years, okay, uh, um, because they had the benefit of both the land for hunting and the sea for food. This was a rich, abundant area. Uh, people were very successful in that land until 
who arrived in those big floating islands we call ships. <laughs> um, we moved from a successful population to uh, people who came here to trade in the 1500s. And the native people were not unwelcoming. They liked the idea of trade. They liked the English items. All the things from pottery to steel knives and axes and guns, all the things that they didn't have access to, and they traded for the things that the Europeans didn't have, particularly furs, okay, beaver in particular. Mm -hmm. And those of you who are familiar with the history of Plymouth know that they originally came over to, to trade for wood and fish, cod, back to England, but soon discovered that they could make far more money by trading with the native people uh, for furs, and that's what they did. So, things seem to be fine, right? Until such time that um, one group uh, arrived of, of traders probably around 1616, and within that year, 1616, and lasting till about 1619, there was a whole series of uh, infectious diseases that covered the southeastern um, Massachusetts and, and uh, uh, not quite into Rhode Island, but definitely along the coast. Ninety percent of the people who were living here died in that three-year period of time. I, I tell people it's it's like somebody set off a neutron bomb and killed all nearly all of the people there, but left everything else intact. So when the pilgrims arrived in 1620, they found nothing but bones on the ground. Well, knowing nothing about infectious disease, they thought simply that God had prepared the way for them, okay? So there were no people there, but there were villages ready to farm, okay, and a good place to settle in Plymouth. Um, the Massasoit, Osamequin. Now, there were many Massasoits. Massasoit simply means chief of chiefs. Uh, but the Massasoit at the time, Osamequin, or Yellow Feather, who was residing probably on Tyler Point at the time, though they moved around a lot. I mean, they didn't have a permanent home like the English did. Uh, but he reasoned that they needed to make some agreement with the pilgrims because he had lost 90% of his population along the coast, including all the warriors there. And the Narragansetts over on the other side of the bay were very interested in coming into this land and he had already lost some land in previous battles. So he made an alliance with the pilgrims, who after all had the things that he didn't have in terms of guns, ammunition, cannons, one thing or another. And with Governor John Carver, struck an agreement in 1621. Uh, they met on March 12th of 1621 and then signed the agreement on April Fool's Day, April 1st, in 1621. Has anybody heard of the, uh, the, the, the Wampanoag Treaty? Nope. Yeah. yeah, nobody tells you anything about that. But that was the singular most important treaty. It is celebrated by our government. Any of you seen the Sacagawea dollar coin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Turn it over. Huh. The other side, the Wampanoag Treaty, 1621. Huh. The U.S. government had never acknowledged it until this coin was struck and hasn't done a thing about it since. But that treaty, which had eight points, uh, basically said, we're not going to harm you, you're not going to harm us, and we'll protect each other against our common enemies. Okay, And it was a very important treaty, because had that treaty not been in effect, number one, if the Massasoit wanted to, he could have sent, sent the English packing. He, he, you know, they've done that with French trading ships in the past. It wasn't a, a difficult thing for them to do. To, drive them away, kill them, and get them out of here, okay? He didn't want that. He wanted them there, and he wanted an alliance. Um, and with that alliance, he was able, along with his people, to offer the kind of information that the pilgrims needed to survive. Remember, they came from England with a different climate, different soil, different fish, and knew very little about how to survive. Half of them died in that first winter, but through the help of the Poconoca tribe, they were able to learn how to successfully farm, 
how, how to successfully fish and how to hunt. And in that process, we're able not only to survive, but then eventually to thrive. So if it weren't for the help of the Massasoit, we'd probably be speaking Dutch. Okay. <laughs> Ed Winslow on the Mayflower, okay, he was basically like their chief of staff there, uh, decided that because of this agreement that was so important to them, that he should come and see this guy, uh, Osamequin, at his home. So in uh, on June or July, it's a little fuzzy in terms of uh, when exactly he came down here, he came with a small entourage walking all the way from Plymouth down to probably where uh, Tyler Point is in Bristol right now, okay, to meet with the Massasite. And there's a terrific description of that in Mort's Relation. If you want to go back and read the 1624 account of that, it's written out in multiple pages and you can get all the detail on that. Uh, some people in Warren think that he met uh, the Massasoit at the uh, spring um, on Baker Street in Warren, uh, which is the Massasoit Spring. I, of course, point out to people there's another Massasoit Spring across the river in, in uh, Barrington. So where exactly they met, we're not really sure. But it cemented their relationship and that really helped with the ongoing relationship and support that they had from one another. Two years later, uh, Winslow gets word that the Massasoit is gravely ill and assembles a group of people, including uh, John Hampton, and came down uh, from Plymouth again and found the Massasoit on his, what appeared to be his deathbed. Um, there's a great video, if you want to look on the website under videos, you'll see uh, a whole depiction of that uh, encounter. Uh, but basically, uh, Winslow cures the Massasoit of his illness. Um, a little uh, uh, potion here, a little scraping of the tongue there, one thing or another. He did what uh, any good leader from uh, the English colonies would have done uh, to help cure someone because they had no doctors. Uh, but fortunately, the Massasoit recovers gets his eyesight back um, and cements the relationship again, saying, Winslow, we will be friends for life. So, if you want to have some idea what things looked like back then, take a Google map, erase all the towns, <laughs> and draw in open fields. And this, this is what surprised me. I thought, well, there would be lots of virgin forests with huge chestnut and oak trees and one thing or another. No, the native people for centuries had been clearing the land by burning in the spring and fall in order to keep the land open so that they could hunt. Okay, it's a lot easier to hunt if you don't have underbrush and you just have open forests and uh, fields for planting. Um, so I created Barrington, that's Tyler Point again there with the, uh, their, uh, the village where Osamequin met and probably where the Dutch trading ship that came in in 1623 landed. Uh, there was a trading post we know in 1632 that's probably like the Hoxie House that's pictured there in uh, uh, down in Cape Cod. Uh, but this area was remarkably park-like and was described by none other than Miles Standish as this open, beautiful area just right for what did the English want to do here? Raise their animals, grow their crops, okay, and move around easily. So by having this open land, he discovered this, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you, you come into this area and suddenly it's everything you wanted, okay. So uh, he described it as uh, the garden of the patent, the patent was how he got the land from the king, um, and the flower, although he misspelled it as F-L-O-U-R, <laughs> of the garden. But that was his description of, of, of the land at the time and gives you some idea of why the English wanted to move out of Plymouth and down to this area. So he wasn't the only one who came down here as an Englishman. Roger Williams. I won't go into the fascinating story of Roger Williams, but Roger, you recall, uh, came over uh, 
uh, to Boston uh, in 1631, uh, was appointed to, to a church uh, um, down in Plymouth and spent two years in Plymouth and got to know the Osamequan in Plymouth. And that's how he became friends with the native people and learned to speak their language, which very few of the English people took the trouble to do. He ended up uh, getting in a little trouble in Plymouth, then went up to uh, um, Salem and got into even more trouble, so much so that the English authorities uh, decided in 1636 they were going to send him back to England. Okay, well uh, he got word of the fact that they were going to put him on a ship and take him back, so he left out of uh, Salem in January, one of the worst winters of that period, and walked from Salem down to probably, we think, a place um, just over the Warren line in Swansea called Margaret's Rock, uh, which was a winter encampment of the native uh, uh, people. They moved away from the shore in the wintertime for protection from the wind and cold, and probably sheltered Roger there. The Williams family has a marker there um, and uh, helped him recover from his illness that he acquired over the, um, of the time in his travels. Um, it took 14 weeks before he was well enough uh, to be able to try to establish a new colony. And Osamequin said, uh, why don't you go up near Omega Pond, which is now East Providence. So that's where he, he went and established uh, the area in Omega Pond. If you go up on Roger Williams Avenue, anybody ever been to this marker? It's at the back of that uh, in the middle picture there. Yeah, nobody can find it. <laughs> it's it's the the uh, first place that Roger Williams um, first first landed. So Roger settled there, uh, raised some crops, brought his folks down uh, from uh, Salem, until he got word from Plymouth that th he was in their territory and he had to remove. So you've. Hopefully, if you're good Rhode Islanders, and I know not everybody's from Rhode Island, but uh, you will hear the story about crossing the Seekonk River in canoes, meeting uh, the uh, Canonicus, the at the time Narragansett chief, and being greeted, what cheer, knee top? Okay, you may have heard that expression. Um, and then uh, basically founded Providence at that point, uh, having r removed from the Plymouth colony land in East Providence, but you can still visit the site. There's also uh, uh, the, uh, two of the oldest houses. This is the Daggett House from about 1690 and um, the Walker House from, we thought a little before 1700, but probably a little later than that. Uh, but those are some of the oldest houses around here. So Roger ends up at uh, where you now find the Roger Williams Memorial. I hope you've had a chance to visit yes. if you haven't. It's definitely worth the trip down there. They're open seven days a week from nine to five. Nice little visitor center up there on the right and uh, a good place. Uh, it only takes 30 minutes. You can stop in, see a video, talk to the park rangers and learn the whole story there. Uh, but in the painting on the lower left, you see an artist's depiction of what Providence must have looked like in 1650 with the settlement along North Main Street, but also over here, Smith Hill, which is now where the State House is, okay, the Great Salt Pond, now all filled in except for the water fire area, okay, and then back here in Nudaconicut Hill. Anybody been there? I never yeah. heard of it. Invited, well, yeah. yeah. Beyond, it's a, beyond uh, Only Square, Only Square. Absolutely. It's the western boundary of Providence, mm -hmm. and it's a great view if you walk up there. You can see the whole area from there. And that was an important meeting place for native people at the time, and the place where Canonicus took Roger and said, you can have all this land pointing to the Providence area and down south. So um, that defined the area that Roger set up. And I could do a whole talk on Roger, but we'll move on. Uh, I just want to point out that the bridge down at the bottom of College Street um, is the Waybosset Bridge. That's the eighth bridge that's been there. The first one was 1660, wow. okay? And Roger was 
the toll taker on the bridge. <laughs> okay. so, That's a great story. That's great. I won't go into all the land transfers here, that would take another hour, but basically <laughs> land was bought, sold, uh, towns were renamed. I hope you know if you're from Barrington that that was Warren at one point, <laughs> then it became Barrington. Swansea got carved out. Uh, the, all these shifts uh, are complicated. Um, and I finally found out that the line that now defines uh, the uh, Warren, uh, sorry, the Rhode Island versus Massachusetts line was never even walked by surveyors. It was simply a line drawn on a map. Oh, I guess we'll go here, <laughs> which is why it's so crazy. <laughs> Makes no sense whatsoever. How many people have been by the Newman Church in uh, East Providence? How many of you know that it was started, the first settlement in this area, 1643? Wow. Okay. And if you go to the cemetery across the street, you'll see some of the people who were there at the time. They established something called the Ring of the Green, uh, which is a, basically a town common, but a large town common, so that everyone could have a farmland that connected in the front to the common, but into the back to water on places like the Ten Mile River, uh, which if you ever get a chance to go to Hunts Mills, okay, it's a wonderful little park, lots of interpretive signs, and you'll learn all about the first mills that were created there in the 1600s, okay, because English people had to have their grain ground and had to have their fabric woven, okay, so you had to have mills. Not far from there in Rehoboth. Um, anybody explored Rehoboth? If you're not from here, you'll probably never go to Rehoboth. There's no reason to go to Rehoboth. There's, you know, people get lost there. I mean, I think there's a good ice cream story. Yeah, there may be <laughs> way up and around, right? But it's a farming community, and it's used to be wide open because they cleared all the land. Now, with all the trees, you cannot tell where you are. If I didn't have GPS, I would never go there. It's just all these little country lanes you go down, and you don't know where you are. There's no reference point. There's no high point to look at the whole thing. There's no lakes. There's only a couple small rivers that you can't even see, and one thing or another. But that was the original land grant of a 10 by 10 mile area that uh, was formed Rehoboth where the Newman Church was. It's since been split off. Uh, it's now Rehoboth proper, but Seekonk and then East Providence were all carved out of the original Rehoboth property. But you can find some evidence of the 17th century there, uh, the dam there in the little town, they have some signs about uh, some of the garrison houses that they set up for the King Philip War. Which brings me to the King Philip War. Uh, if you didn't grow up around here, you probably never heard of it. Nobody in this country hears about the King Philip War. It was the bloodiest war in North America. It was the war that defined all wars from then on. It was the war that created our national policy about the removal of Indians all the way to the West Coast but you don't hear about it. Kids who go to school here get, you know, a paragraph, oh, there was a war. Lasted 14 months, but it redefined everything, okay? Um, that war, this is a map I put together of, if you look at the little yellow dots around there, those are all the English settlements that surrounded uh, the Bristol Peninsula down here, and the red areas were the original native areas but they shrank as more and more land was sold, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, leaving by 1675, only 700 people living right where you are now, okay, um, uh, who were fearful that because the English population was exploding, there were 50,000 English people at the time, um, that they would lose their country. They would lose their way of life, their culture, everything. So, not really by plan, but by happenstance, a war broke out. There were first um, uh, skirmishes um, right on near Child Street uh, in Warren, and then further up Market Street, uh, there was a garrison house where the uh, British troops came down and established uh, uh, an outpost 
uh, and then marched all the way down to Mount Hope uh, and in, in pursuit of Philip. Philip was Massasoit's son. Massasoit had, uh, the Massasoit had died in 1660, and from 1660 to 1675, there's a lot of history, but basically it wasn't looking better for the Poconocuts. It was looking worse and worse and worse. And that outbreak looks, for all intents and purposes, as it was a reaction to their uh, losing their land over time. The war uh, was bloody on both sides. Uh, 25 towns in uh, mostly in Massachusetts, but also all of Providence were burned to the ground. Um, the uh, troops um, followed the native uh, uh, people all the way up into western Massachusetts, Deerfield. Their effort was to try to push the, the English people back to England, get them back on the boats, and some people did. They left and went back to England. Others went down to Newport for safety. Uh, but by the time that Philip was shot right over here in Mount Hope, and you can visit the site, there's a marker there. Um, the native people were um, either killed, ens enslaved, or removed from the area. And that's why people say, well, there aren't any Indians around here. I wonder why. Well, there was a very explicit policy to remove native people from this area following the war. From one point of view, it's understandable. It was a vicious, bloody war, and why wouldn't people want to see them gone? On the other hand, these are people who remember who were living here for 12,000 years, who ended up with no rights, no land, okay, nothing to call their own, okay. So here's the marker over at Mount Hope where uh, Philip was shot. Uh, if you go up uh, into Barrington at the end of Barneyville Road, you'll find a marker for the Miles Garrison. Um, that's a picture, it's since been removed, but uh, uh, you can find some of that evidence there. Um, up further in Rehoboth, you'll find Anawan Rock, uh, which was the place where Anawan, who was Philip's lieutenant, was captured uh, following the war. And then uh, Benjamin Church, you've heard of Benjamin Church Manor down here. Well, Church had lived down in Little Compton but he had gotten to know the native people very well and learned their ways in terms of warfare and was able to be successful in fighting them because rather than following the British rule of stand, load, and shoot, uh, they would do guerrilla warfare into the woods the way the native people did. And finally, because the native people ran out of food and ammunition, uh, the, the English prevailed in that war. And that finally ended um, in August of 1676. You will find evidence from that period of time all over the place if you know where to look and if you go on the website, psalmsheritageareal.org, you will find a whole map. You can see it in the brochure. These are all kinds of places. Burial grounds of people buried there before 1700. The ancient Little Neck Cemetery over in Riverside, great place to visit. Uh, the the, uh, Tom Willett, the former mayor of New York City, twice, <laughs> is buried there, along with Elizabeth Tilly, who has a fascinating story. It should be in the movies at some point, because Elizabeth uh, came from England um, on the Mayflower in 1620, l managed to survive all that time, survived through the war, and lived in Riverside until her death just prior to 1700. Uh, and is buried there. Uh, what a story she would have been able to tell. Okay, um, Serpentine Road in, in Warren's got another cemetery. Uh, Tyler Point has a, a cemetery, etc. Uh, there are farms around here from that period of time. Um, down here at the bottom is uh, the um, um, Chase Farm in North Warren um, off of uh, Birch Swamp Road. It's a King's Grant. 1697, okay? It's been in the same family all that time. Okay, Brigham Farm up in East Providence. Here's the Key Farm also in Tewissett, okay? From the 1600s, okay? So some things haven't changed in that time if you know where to look, as a lot of natural areas. Here's uh, Soames Woods over in Barrington, 
beautiful area with Echo Lake. If you get, ever get a chance to walk around it, here's uh, Tewissett. Uh, if you ever go to the Audubon area there, uh, the Handham Meadows Trail, and the Weeposset Preserve. Anybody been there? It's in Bristol. It's down off of Narrows Road. Great place to hike and walk into the woods, and you can see things the way they were 400 years ago. Along Market Street in Warren, you know where Johnson's Market is on Route 136? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The southern end of his property, that where the uh, Warren Swansea line crosses, is this large rock. And if you're going south, it'll be on your right. That's King's Rock. Well, what happened on King's Rock? Native American women went up there and ground corn by rolling a large stone on a groove down the center of the rock that you can see, and you can walk up there and take a look at that. Tim owns that part, of that end of the rock, and he's more than welcome to, uh, to have people come there and take a look. Across the street, anybody ever notice that large boulder sitting on a um, bedrock outcropping? It's hard to see right now this time of year because there's a lot of uh, vines and brush and stuff in front of it, but if you notice that, What's kind of interesting about that? You see a lot of boulders like that around? No. Huh? No. Okay. Uh, the geologists will tell you that's, that's a glacial erratic, okay? Deposited there by the glaciers, you know. They, they rolled stones along and then the ice melted and the big bulk. And I understand that. There are lots of places where that's the case. But notice what's underneath that rock. Another rock. Another rock. Yeah. yeah. Did the glacier put that rock there? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> That's called a perched rock or a balanced rock, and it's on bedrock for a purpose because native people would put rocks like that. You get 20 strong guys and you can roll that rock from wherever they found it and put it up there because on bedrock, you can rock the rock back and forth. It's a drum rock that can be heard for miles around and it's a connection between the underworld, not hell, the underworld that they believed, and the sky, because they were very much oriented in terms of stars and the position of stars. It's also on top of something called Sachem's Knoll, and if you're up there, you can see the blades of the um, turbines at Allen's Point in Providence with your naked eye, okay? It's easy to see them, they're right there, <laughs> okay? This was a sacred place, and we know that they used to have ceremonies and gatherings there. It was also the area that the, the, the English uh, soldiers, militia, marched through at the start of the King Philip War. Very important place, nobody knows a thing about it. Um, if you go behind Swansea Town Hall, you'll find Abrams Rock. This is. Uh, King Philip's seat up in Mount Hope, uh, which you can access if you go to the farm and ask them. You have to go during weekdays and say, I want to I want to walk up to uh, King Philip's seat. They'll have you sign up permission for him because it's on Brown University property and you can go there. This is at Nudaconicut Hill where the four tribes, Massachusetts, Nipmuc, um, uh, uh, Poconocut, and Narragansett would meet for tribal councils. Okay. Back to Burr's Hill, if you go over there, stop uh, at the town beach there and walk up. You can't really see it until you get up on top of the, the mounds there, which I always thought were Indian burial mounds. Well, it's true that there were Indians who were buried there, but they didn't create the mounds. In fact, all of Burr's Hill was mounds at one point until the railroad came through in 1854. And took a lot of the sand and gravel out of that area to build the railroad south of there. And then the town in 1921 acquired the land and leveled it to make a ball field. But fortunately, they did not dig up the mounds that are still there where the burials took place that um, Charles Carr uh, exhumed in 1913. Um, when they were put back into the vault here, uh, there was a celebration by the Mashpee tribe who had done the collecting, and uh, it was a very important thing for them to have their their ancestral leader, the Massasoit Osamequin, return to the grave where he was uh, originally buried. So, just to finish up here, um, Bristol, 
laid out in 1680. You all know the, the house uh, just uh, along Hope Street? You'll recognize this one? Yeah. Across some sip and dip there, you know. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's apartments. It's not, it hasn't been restored. Hopefully someday that'll happen. But that was the first house ever built in Bristol, 1680. I always thought that was a joke. Oh, 1680. Oh, it can't be. It is. The wood from that house came from England. No. They didn't have the mills to create it here, so they brought it over on a ship. Okay. Um, and that at one point was Silver Creek, okay, and had a, this is what it looked like about the turn of the 20th century. And that was the home of the original um, pastor for the church. You could not have a town without a church. You couldn't have a church without a pastor. So what they did to create a town in 1680 was to first build a parsonage, and then import Nathaniel Bosworth over to be their pastor. And four years later, they built the first meeting house, uh, basically the first church on the town common. Um, there's no pictures. This is somebody's recreation of what they think it looked like. Um, if you go in the museum of the church, and we're about to uh, put us, we just got approval to put an interpretive sign out in front of the church, so you'll know more about it when you go there. Uh, but inside the church, um, if you asked to see, get, to get in the museum, you'll see uh, the pew end from the church in 1684, uh, the chalice uh, used for communion there, um, some of the early pastors, they aren't really buried there, that's just their grave markers that were moved from the town common. They left everybody in the town common and just moved all the grave markers, okay? So even, even uh, when you go across the street there, uh, you'll see the gravestones nicely lined up. Well, they weren't that way originally. The bodies are still under the town common, under the playground there. Okay. That's um, weird. Wow. Yeah. That's true. Well, that's, you know, uh, when they started out, they didn't have any idea that, you know, they needing a you know, cemetery, so people got buried in all kinds of places. Um, the two other uh, old, older houses, Elm Farm, which is at the, uh, just down here on the you can walk to it over here. Mm -hmm. uh, this portion in the back uh, was from about uh, uh, 1695. And then, of course, the Joseph Reynolds house, which I'm sure you mm -hmm. recognize the red house there. It was the first three-story house ever built in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. um, but that was from uh, um, 1698 and housed Lafayette during the um, Revolutionary War and things of that sort. But those are pre-1700 houses. Those are the only ones remaining um, in Bristol. If you go over to Barrington, the John Martin house, uh, just at the end of the bridge from the opposite end of the uh, white church there. Um, they've been trying to sell it, so if you want to buy it, there's not a <laughs> chance. Um, uh, that's the oldest house, about 1680. Um, Hill Noon's Farm up on Market Street in Warren. Um, Across from Choppies, <laughs> you know where that is. Uh, just past where the Country Inn, and, you, you know, used to be. <laughs> uh, good run on directions. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, that's still there and intact, and I've uh, toured the farm. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, this is the perfect time to, to visit the other John Martin house in Swansea on Route 6. It's open Sundays from now till end of September, from Sundays from 1 to 4 anyway. Uh, it's run by the Colonial Dames, and it's a great chance for a $5 donation to see what life was like in the 1600s here. Okay. Um, the William Hunt House in Seekonk, and then the Kingsley House in Rehoboth are um, two of the uh, 17th century houses in the area. You want to meet the uh, Poconoka tribe? They're still here. Okay, even though there were all kinds of attempts to drive people away, there are about 200 members of the tribe who live in the area. Uh, they get together. I was just with them down at Mount Hope Farm uh, for their uh, Strawberry Moon uh, Thanksgiving Festival, and they do that every year. Um, we've had uh, uh, nine presentations in area schools, uh, supported by the Rhode Island Council on the Humanities. We got a grant from them for that. This is the Tribal Council today. This is them up at the uh, uh, Mount Hope, uh, uh, the King Philip seat. Uh, these are 
these guys, one's 80 and the other's 83, and they're, they're dancing like you never, never yeah. s saw. And I'm working with a, another group of the, the, um, um, the Pog Indians in the uh, um, Providence area, and we're going to be doing a whole regional thing shortly. So that's 45 minutes. So uh, now you have it. I've told you everything. In a nutshell, uh, <laughs> I can provide some more detail, but I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. So. Please tell other people I'm happy to talk with any group anytime. Um, I charge you the same thing. Uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs>